Well, Asia's economic growth is providing many opportunities for Australian businesses. The Australian government's Asian Century White Paper has been released and now the focus is on how Australian companies gear themselves up to take advantage. To talk more about this, I spoke earlier with Rohini Kapita, the Director of Cross Border Business at Picture Partners. Rohini Kapita, thanks for joining Business Today. Thanks, Simon. Great to be here. Now, we know that uh, Australia earns a lot of money uh, in Asia uh, from its mining output, but of course the opportunities go much further than that these days, don't they? Absolutely. The Asia opportunity has just started and has decades to play out. The next uh, boom on the horizon, I think, is the agribusiness sector, which um, is going to present an opportunity of about $1.7 trillion in, by about 2050 for all of Australia. So uh, farmers have the opportunity now to consider how they can gear up to become uh, part of, uh, you know, becoming the food bowl of Asia. Beyond that, there's a massive opportunity for, for the services sector. So I think the big push now into Asia should be by our businesses that provide specialist services, like, um, you know, apart from, of course, the education boom that we've seen. So uh, we, we've all been witness to uh, the massive benefit that um, our education sector has, uh, has enjoyed. And that is going to flow through to architects, designers, consulting engineers, people who are building bridges across Asia to uh, meet their massive you know urbanization that's occurring across Asia. So Australian uh, is Australian services are, off, are well established already in mining and education as you say but to be able to break into these other areas we've got to uh, get over that big hurdle of our high, very high cost of labor here. Um, how do we do that? Yes, well, we've got to get really smart about this and that uh, we've got to play in niches. We've got to find innovative niche, niches that we've that are well researched, uh, so where we have clear differentiation. We can't really play in um, sectors where scale is important. So we've got to go for quality in in these niches and we've got to start to learn to operate in a slightly different way in that we've got to start to cluster uh, together with other players. Uh, we've got to learn to collaborate with our with our competitors across Asia. We've got to com collaborate with players here in Australia as well. So we've the, the game's changed. The rules of the game are changing and we've gonna we're going to have to shift our strategies to match what it's going to take to be successful in Asia. But variations in the cost of labor are still a huge issue, aren't they? They are indeed. And, you know, this is a uh, this is an issue that we're going to have have to really deal as a government as well um, because uh, you know at the end of the day Australia is uh, we, we have 23 million people we're a small country in com you know compared to the, all the other countries that we're competing against those countries have very low cost of labor uh, unless and until we go up the value chain and become viewed as absolute specialists in key areas be they in the medical services industry or in um, uh, water management and green technologies and IT solutions so we've really got to find where we can create that differentiation for ourselves and I was reading some of your work uh, which suggests there's a trend for Australian companies to focus their attention on just the Asian capital cities rather than looking further abroad into Asian regional centres. Uh, is that important for Australian companies to start doing? Well, the growth engine for in, in Asia is really driven by the regional centres. Let's look at China, for example. You know, Chongqing has about 32 million people. It, this is becoming the major, in, you know, infrastructure and the transportation hub of the Upper Upper Yangtze River region. Um, Chengdu, Changsha, Wuhan. These are all cities, regional centres in across China that are absolutely, you know, are hubs of activity. And there's masses of, you know, aspiring Chinese people who are looking to consume more more products um, same the same stories can be seen in India as well the the the, the real growth centers come out of cities like uh, you know Jamshedpur, Rorkela, Ranchi, Gwalior, Chandigarh, Surat you know um, the the India has about in excess of about 51, 1 million plus cities. China has about 93, 5 million plus cities, so in, the, in terms of population. So the growth centers really are shifting, and, and, and now uh, Australian com businesses really have to research where they where they enter these markets and find the the activity in the regional centers I guess a lot of Australian company uh, business leaders might be worried that infrastructure um, might not be um, up to scratch in those more regional centers is that the case still not really not in China at least I mean I visited some of these cities and the infrastructure I would say compares to Melbourne as well so um, 
that may not be the case in India. India is sort of lagging behind. Uh, but at the same time, that represents a big opportunity for uh, builders, construction services providers, people who are actually able to offer services to this, uh, to meet this massive demand for infrastructure. Infrastructure the same as Melbourne, but pro probably three times the population. Sounds OK. Um, how will the change in leadership in China affect uh, opportunities for Australian businesses? Well, China is um, rebalancing its economy at the moment, and they're moving away from the investment phase that, that's really driven growth in China, driven the astounding GDP figures that we've been seeing out of China, and they're moving towards a phase where consumption is going to be the main driver of uh, economic growth. However, that transition is going to be bumpy, so it remains to see how the uh, current leadership is going to conduct itself economically and politically. Uh, Li Jinping um, you know, leads the party, however, it, this is the same team that uh, that 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 has developed the current 12th year plan for for China. So it is expected to be a reformist government, but it remains to see whether they're going to have the courage to make these massive changes that, that China requires. In fact, I will talk about the debt levels in, in the Chinese um, government at the moment, in that the local council um, uh, debt is spiraling out of control. And this is something that they've really got to bring under, uh, you know, very quickly control so that they're not having to constantly pump money into the infrastructure and this investing in the infrastructure in order to keep the GDP growth numbers up. Um, once the Chinese start to consume, it's the consumption that, 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 that they're hoping will drive the economic growth. OK, Rohini Kapadar, thank you very much for your time today. Pleasure, Simon. Good